academic ceremony in which he what uh, Mekon and Mesfin will defend the academic thesis entitled Essays on Human and Social Capital Formation. Uh, dear candidate, may I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis? Thank you for it. Um, I now share my screen. Um, dear Corrector, dear members of the Corona, dear friends um, and colleagues, in the next 15 minutes, I'll be presenting a short summary of my dissertation titled Essays on Human and Social Capital Formation. My presentation will start with a brief introduction, followed by the three separate empirical chapters and ends with some concluding remarks. Um, the reality, uh, some societies have achieved higher economic well-being, while others struggle, has been at the center of social science research for decades. And evidence from such work has been showing that differences in demographic, geographic, historical, and political factors explain such uh, disparities. This thesis focuses on two specific demographic factors, human and social capital, both central to economic growth. While human capital is key in the production process, social capital is crucial in facilitating transactions. And this dissertation provides some insights on how they develop and how they shape economically desirable behavior. Specifically, it does so by answering the following research questions. First, does sibling sex composition matter in adolescents' human capital development and why? Second, how do conditional and unconditional cash transfer programs affect social capital and a real ordered collective action behavior proxied by voting? And third, do demand side factors such as overconfidence and trust affect farmers' information seeking behavior? Um, the first empirical chapter investigates the effects of sibling sex composition on human capital development. The reason we're interested in this topic is mainly because the family is where children develop most of their skills and preferences. And evidence so far has been showing that, for example, um, individuals who grew up with more sisters tend to be less competitive and more likely to choose the humanities as their fields of specialization. Um, and those who grew up with brothers, more brothers, tend to be more risk takers and happier. Um, there is also evidence that investigates the effects of sibling sex composition on human capital outcomes, even though these are concentrated in Western and Asian societies and provide inconclusive evidence, where in some cases they show that having more brothers increases human capital outcomes, and in others they find the opposite. Um, why do we expect sibling sex composition would affect human capital outcomes? Um, there could be many reasons, but here in this chapter, we, we um, hypothesize the following um, three relationships. So firstly, since households um, would be resource constrained, they would have to invest their limited resources in such a way that maximizes um, their return. And since existing labor market signals boys to be high return children, parents would invest more on boys than on girls. And this, um, of, since some investments might be difficult to exclude others, um, such investment could spill over and increase human capital outcomes. Secondly, it could also be that brothers um, would contribute to household income. This is particularly true in developing countries where it's common to find um, boys engaged in income generating activities. And such increase in household income could, could lead to um, higher physical and mental well-being, which then could increase human capital outcomes. Um, we, it could also be that uh, sex composition would have an implication on household gender norms, where we, we um, hypothesize that having more brothers, for example, would increase um, with, uh, females uh, hours spent on traditionally female specific tasks um, and decreases, decreases it for boys because now boys can share um, boys specific tasks. And as a result, for example, now when, uh, female children with more brothers would have to spend more time on uh, household chores um, leading to lower time um, available for studying, um, and this could decrease their human capital outcomes. But for boys, since now they can share boy-specific tasks, they would have more time to study and could, could lead to higher human capital outcomes. How do we test um, our hypothesis? We use the data from uh, Ethiopia's Young Lives Project. This project follows the lives of um, 3,000 children in poverty. Our variable of interest is the share of brothers. Uh, our outcome variables are highest grade attained and English and mathematics scores. 
um, for our mediators, physical well-being is proxied by BMI for age, and mental well-being is proxied by adolescents' um, subjective assessment of their life satisfaction. Gender norms um, is proxied by hours spent spent on um, um, household chores and productive tasks. And for our spillover mechanism, we rely on um, the elder siblings education as a proxy. Our identification strategy uh, relies on the assumptions that in the absence of sex selective reproduction, the share of brothers for a given number of siblings would be exogenous. And for analysis, we use oil less regression. Um, what do we find? We find that having more brothers instead of sisters increases um, great attainment and mathematics and English skills. It also increases boys' physical well-being and reinforces traditional gender norms. And it increases elder siblings' great attainment. Our mediation analysis shows that neither well-being nor gender norms mediate brothers' human capital effects, but the elder siblings' education does. And we interpret this to mean that um, parents do invest uh, more in boys, and that investment seems to be spilling over to the elder sibling education, and then that might have been ser uh, serving as a, a tutoring or a role model and increasing human capital outcomes of the young life child. The second empirical chapter uh, investigates the effects of conditional and unconditional cash transfer programs on social capital. Um, why are we interested in this? Mainly because um, cash transfers have been widely adopted by governmental and non-governmental um, organizations in their effort to fight poverty. And there is encouraging evidence on their intended effects. So studies have been showing that they increase schooling outcomes, health outcomes, and consumption. However, there is less evidence on their unintended effects. And in this chapter, we try to contribute towards this by investigating their effects on social capital and collective action behavior. We also investigate whether their effects could be different because the two cash transfer formats, um, uh, cash transfers follow different formats. For example, it could be that conditional cash transfers affect a more conditional behavior such as trust, while unconditional cash transfers could affect a more altruistic behavior such as voting. Um, we also further look into impact heterogeneities by baseline reciprocal beliefs, um, sociability, and wealth status. How do we uh, uh, test for our hypothesis? We use data from a randomized controlled trial conducted in Malawi on about 3,000 women between the ages of 13 and 22 at baseline. Um, our variable of interest are offered to either conditional cash transfer programs or unconditional cash transfer programs. Our outcome variables are interpersonal trust, gift giving, and voting. Uh, our moderators, reciprocal beliefs, um, asks uh, adolescent women whether they believe other people are helpful or not. Um, sociability is an index we construct by aggregating um, the adolescent women's participation in weddings, funerals, and the number of times they hang out with their friends. And wealth is proxied by a asset index. For identification, since we have uh, a random treatment assignment, we use OLS and estimate intention to treat effects of program offer. Um, our results show that conditional cash transfers increase interpersonal trust and gift giving behavior, but not the unconditional cash transfer program. And young women with reciprocal beliefs um, drive the conditional cash transfers effect on social capital. We also find that both conditional and unconditional cash transfers reduce voting. Um, the third empirical chapter investigates the roles of overconfidence and trust on farmers' information seeking behavior. Why are we interested in this? Mainly because there has been large efforts trying to link farmers to new information and knowledge. However, progress has been very slow. And there has been studies that try to um, understand the supply side constraints and trying to find ways to improve information diffusion. For example, by um, experimenting with different incentive mechanisms to facilitate diffusion or trying to find a better way to target farmers. But in this chapter, we take a different route and investigate um, potential demand side factors that might be affecting information seeking. And this is where we ask whether farmers' perception of their own skills and the skills of their sources would matter. Um, to test for our hypothesis, we conducted a lab in the field experiment uh, in Ethiopia with 760 farmers. The task involved uh, farmers solving two sets of questions. The first one we call familiar because here farmers solve farming related questions. And the second one, 
we call unfam unfamiliar because here farmers solved Raven's matrices. But before farmers uh, proceeded to solving these uh, um, questions, we showed them a couple of examples and elic elicited their um, expected performance because we need this to construct one of our outcome um, variables of interest. Um, our outcome variable is seeking help from designated sources. These sources could be either peer farmers or extension agents. They could be either trained or untrained, or they could be presented as high trust or low trust sources. And farmers were randomly assigned to either one of these sources. Our variable of interest, firstly, uh, is overconfidence, which we construct by subtracting farmers' actual performance from their expected performance. And we have quality and trust treatment indicators. For analysis, we use random forest for prediction and OLS to estimate average treatment effects of trust and quality treatments. What do we find? We find that majority of farmers are overconfident, uh, but overconfidence is higher in familiar tasks than in the unfamiliar task. And overconfidence predicts less information seeking. We also find that farmers seek more information from high quality and high trust sources. To conclude, since we find that sibling sex composition matters in adolescent semen capital formation, policy interventions are needed to correct existing labor market disparities so that they can send the correct uh, signal to guide parents' investment decisions. And secondly, since we find that uh, conditional cash transfers increase social capital, but not unconditional cash transfers, and both reduce political participation, policymakers could enjoy gains in, uh, in the form of social capital by adopting conditional cash transfers instead of unconditional cash transfers. And third, since we find that majority of farmers are overconfident and overconfidence predicts less information seeking, um, policy experimentation is needed to find ways to, um, to counter the overconfidence bias. And since we find uh, farmers seek from, uh, more information from high trust sources, uh, policymakers could work towards increasing the trustworthiness of their agricultural information sources. Thank you for listening. Um, I now give the floor back to the proctor. Dear candidate, thank you for your presentation. The opposition will be opened by Professor Gasman, who is a professor of social protection and development at the UNU Merit of Maastricht University. Professor Gasman. Dear candidate, dear Hewat, thank you very much uh, for, the, for your thesis. And also as a first, uh, let's say, opponent, I also would like to take this opportunity to congratulate you with your thesis, because it is a very well executed and also a well written thesis, which empirically analyzes the relevance of different social and human capital factors for development, as you just neatly outlined in your presentation. What we also saw from your presentation is uh, that you are actually having, let's say, analyzing three rather different topics. Yes. So we move from, let's say, the relevance of sibling for child schoolings in chapter two. Then we go to the, the impact of a conditional cash transfer or cash transfer program on various social capital indicators. And finally, we actually end up with farmers and to understand that they are more or less two confident in order to accept uh, and seek advice. I think I would like to challenge you a little bit here, uh, uh, dear Hewat, because given that we have these three different aspects of human and social capital, and they are presented in one thesis, and then if you now look at your thesis, what would you consider the most important contribution of your thesis if you have to choose among these three chapters? And are there lessons learned across the three themes? Do you see their links between the three studies? And what would be, can we learn from that for potential policy solutions? Uh, hi, esteemed opponent. Thank you for your words. And um, a very challenging question that I've been dealing with um, for a while, especially when I was trying to compile the thesis and trying to find a, a theme. Um, I understand it's not uh, quite straightforward um, to, to find the, the link, but the challenge was mainly like trying to balance 
um, the nobility of each chapter with, um, of course, having one team, right? So having said that, um, okay, so the first question was what, which chapter would be more, um, which chapter do I like more? If I got it correct. Yeah, it's not so much what you like. Yeah, maybe it is also what you like more, huh? but it is really about, let's say, overall, the essays are about human and social capital formation and essentially to what extent actually it contributes to, I would say, the economic and human development in a country. Now, what would be more important, let's say, to somehow change the siblings ratio in a household or actually to provide cash transfers or make sure that the farmers uh, go and seek advice? So what is from this development angle, which of your findings do you think have the largest, might have the largest impact or as such, maybe most valuable? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is very difficult to answer. It's like um, trying to say, to choose from like your children or something. <laughs> uh, so I would say each chapter has its own uh, contribution or implication. So um, as the results also show, for example, uh, having more brothers seems to be driving more parental investment. Um, this could have an implication, of course, if it's because of the existing labor market um, uh, disparities it would nudge or it would signal that we need to work on closing this gap. And that I would say is um, a, a valuable contribution, right? Because we need to close the investment gap. Otherwise, we're going to be in a vicious cycle where we have um, parents investing more in boys and boys have higher human capital outcomes, end up being high return um, uh, in the labor market, same the signal again, and we, we will be in that um, spiral. So I would say this has a, a good contribution there. Uh, I also would say um, the chapter on overconfidence uh, would have um, an important implication for, for policymakers because often um, these kinds of behavioral biases and the de demand side um, constraints usually either focus on like resource constraints. For example, farmers are not taking new, uh, new uh, technology or information because they have liquidity constraints. But it's also now it provides, okay, maybe there are also some behavioral biases we should focus on and try to tackle. So I would say it also has its own policy relevance. Um, the same with uh, conditional cash transfer and unconditional cash transfer. Again, it's, um, it kind of signals, yes, we have these uh, development programs. Yes, they are showing improvements in um, their intended effects, but they might also be affecting some things that we are not anticipating. And luckily in this case, okay, in terms of social capital, we find that they do seem to increase it. It's a good sign and it's, I would say, uh, informs policy, but it also shows some warning sign where, because we find that both of them are reducing political participation, right? So this also would have um, a policy relevance and kind of nudge policymakers. We should consider what unintended effects our policies might be having. Okay, I mean, I would really like to challenge you on your, you know, on the, the what you just said about the, 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 the outcomes in your chapter three on voting and so on. But I also know that my uh, colleagues here will have some related questions to you, but just maybe to finalize our discussion here. So could it actually be that some of your findings are culturally driven, uh, if you look about that, for example, I mean, to one extent in your chapter, in your first chapter, uh, it is about the, the, the boys versus the girls. And I just wonder if you look at chapter four, are we talking about male and or female, you know, farmers which are overconfident? And so is it then also maybe, could there be a link with the overall educational system in a country? And that there it has to start very early on and also which might, on the one hand, improve the children's or the girls' position and eventually make the farmers more open to go for advice. But it's just uh, something uh, to think about. Thank yes, you, Hivot. Thank you, Heristine. Your position will now be continued by Professor Di Falco, who is Professor of Economics at the University of Geneva. Professor Falco. Thank you. Um, and first of all, as well, I want to uh, spend a few seconds to uh, 
to say how <laughs> delighted am I to have been with you today. And uh, I really enjoy reading your work, Yvette. Uh, congratulations is, a, is an impressive piece of work. Honestly, you know, you really managed to do a lot, to cover a lot within one single PhD thesis, finding many aspects of novelty. So very, very well done. I um, just, uh, you know, uh, give you a couple of uh, questions and, uh, you know, in a sense that these are more meant to kind of feed a conversation and trying to, in a sense, give you some feedback, hopefully to support you in the, the next steps, which should be the publication ones. And my first question goes on the mediation analysis on the first paper. And uh, I completely, uh, you know, I really like the idea, of course, and uh, we, we, in economics, it's always important to explain why. Um, not only what we find, but why we find those results. So I completely second and uh, applaud the, the, the approach and the, the, the your intellectual challenge to try to understand what actually was going on. On the other hand, I, the way the, the mediation analysis is put in place is, a, in my view, can be risky, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure we really get what we like to get. And um, I make a reference, especially on uh, what in economics seems to be the way of doing modern, um, um, mediation analysis, which is, you know, very challenging because you have to find the uh, oxygenous variation also on the, on the, on the moderators. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to, in a sense, ask a bit more about the process you, you undertook, how you identify these variations in the moderators in order to really make those conclusions about well-being and the other channel you are. You are. So I start with this. Hi, listened opponent. Thank you for your words and uh, uh, on obviously challenging question. Um, yes, I, I agree. Um, the mediation analysis isn't um, the most, let's say, rigorous um, because we, our model, model, uh, mediators are uh, endogenous, clearly. And I don't have an approach um, to, to uh, argue that anything was um, exogenous. However, um, we thought maybe it's a good idea because, okay, we are doing this mediation analysis. We are not trying to estimate the effects of these uh, mediators specifically. So we thought, okay, we could tolerate a certain bias and then see how our main results react to the inclusion of these variables. So it's not, um, um, let's say, <laughs> the strongest uh, uh, way to do it. I agree completely, yeah. No, no, I, I, I in the, of course, you're in very good company. I mean, there are hundreds of papers who did exactly that. Uh, so you're not uh, on your own, um, but, in a sense, it, uh, after, after the work of Ackman, we, we, we kind of now try to understand that is in order really to do this properly, uh, the conditions for identification become incredibly more challenging, which you know, makes the entire exercise very, very even more complex. And, but so I, you know, I'm, I wasn't, um, you're in very good company in a sense, but you know, it's gonna be difficult to, to publish this in this way um, because the, the the prior has shifted now, and what does people expect to see what the mediation analysis is? And I'm wondering maybe if you can settle with some uh, checks, you know, kind of tone it down a little bit, um, talk about the checks. Although, of course, you know, there is always the issues of back control and things like that. Uh, in a sense, you know, maybe throw an interaction, mm -hmm. therefore, you know, step in in a world which is indeed more of a moderation rather than mediation. And that, in a sense, you know, you can uh, you you can't really address those channels properly, but at least you know you will show the readers that you've done your own work, and you show the readers that you're aware of the most important question, which is what are the potential channels. And I think there is lots of value in also simply arguing, you know, and bringing you know arguments besides the hard statistical evidence. I mean, at the end of the day. You know, there may be some process you can also explain by simply, you know, providing some more uh, results. So that was the, mm. that's, that's a possibility. I think you could see eventually to kind of repackage that. Yeah. And maybe, you know, if it's possible to consider it as an interaction. That's the, that's the, mm. I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied with the, with your uh, response. 
So I, I go to the next uh, uh, point I have, which is, uh, I mean, when I saw the paper on cash transfer, I said, wow, this is super interesting and incredibly novel because indeed uh, there is a huge literature about transfer and how we make them. Um, and there are people in this room that you know, they, they know much more than I do uh, on this subject. Um, and I start thinking about why, why this outcome? Why this outcome matters in this, you know, because you don't want to give the idea that you just uh, you found an outcome that, uh, you know, hasn't been explored and then, you know, hey, I'm going to use it. So I, I wanted really to get a better sense of why matters to, because the objective of conditional transfer is not social capital, isn't it? The objective of a, of a, of a conditional or unconditional cash transfer is poverty reduction in general relaxing a budget constraint somewhere and in the conditional one you know relaxing a budget constraint and you know finding other objectives which can be very important for development environment and so forth so i i where i really want to get more from this paper is this why this matters and why these two things they should be uh, you know analyzed in this way mm -hmm. uh, Thank you again uh, for uh, for your question. Um, of course, yes, um, it's important to understand why we wanted to look into this effect. Um, obviously, the starting point is trying to see what um, unanticipated effects programs may have. And then when we look into um, cash transfers, it involves um, the provider selecting certain um, um, segments of the population and they provide them with such uh, benefits that others might not receive it. And this kind of arrangement might create some sort of tension, for example, between the recipients and non-recipients and such tension might affect their social capital. If there is, for example, jealousy, um, people might not uh, interact more and the less um, such break happens in their social capital, um, many other aspects of the economic life could also face some consequences. So we thought, okay, let's have a look at what, um, what it's doing to receive the, the, the social capital of um, recipient communities. Um, so that's where we, uh, we got this idea. And then the next interesting point was, okay, um, we are anticipating cash transfers might affect social capital. Um, but we have two different formats and how, how are they affecting um, this, these um, outcomes and would, would they have even different effects because these two are different, different formats. And we, we were interested in, in looking at, um, yeah, this is how we were motivated to look at the, the research question. Um, I don't know if I can, may have a very quick follow-up. Uh, uh, very, very briefly. Uh, okay. Uh, so very briefly, indeed, I will be, um, so in a sense, you have the kind of uh, Angelucci paper 2009, in mm -hmm. which you have cash transfer and social networks, and then are a way to kind of distribute this, this cash transfer. So, you know, there is this, uh, implicitly, there is a pressure to share among people, mm -hmm. right? And my, my question is in understanding why the conditionality should affect that part of the equation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's uh, yes. something I, I don't find very clear, but maybe we not, don't have the time to answer to me now. So uh, just keep this in the back of your head, you know, and get back to me if you wish. Yeah, I could quickly maybe reflect. Um, so why conditionality would matter? Um, for two reasons. So it could be, the conditionality by itself sometimes might lead to, as um, Atanasio uh, says, um, might lead to more interaction. For example, if the conditionality is visiting healthcare facilities, people are going there and meeting, interacting, so it could have an implication on their um, social capital, or school also might do the same. But in our case, we're looking into uh, trust, so it's a conditional behavior kind of thing. Someone is taking care of you, conditional on a certain behavior, so you might develop, like, or you might strengthen your belief um, such such conditional beliefs. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. 
Um, the opposition will then be continued by uh, Dr. Aya Leo, uh, who is a lecturer in development economics at the uh, Oxford Department of International Development. Thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed reading your work, Hjort, and uh, it's a very good presentation. The paper is well written and it raises very good questions that are important for the development literature. And congratulations on that. I have a few questions, one related to chapter two and the other one is related to conditional cash transfer. The first one is related to the fact that the empirical strategy or the results is depend on the identification strategy. So one of the identification strategy in chapter two believes on the fact that there is no sex selection in, in, in the household. But when you see like the situation in our country, particularly in the rural areas where farmers are mostly agrarian, they prefer boys to girls. So how could you reconcile that fact in terms of these strong identifying assumptions? Second one could be related to the time varying unobserved factors that may be potentially correlated with the outcome variable and one of the regression, which is siblings ratio. Let's say, for example, perception of education or parents' income, or let's say parents' education, which may be positively correlated with education, which, which, which is your outcome variable as well as siblings ratio. So if these factors are time varying, mm -hmm. the fixed effect regression that you control in the model may not capture the time varying nature of this data. So how do you reconcile to get unbiased estimates and constant estimates of your, or how do you consider your results are like the causal effects of sex sibling ratio? Mm -hmm. And the last one is related to voting. Like, in your paper, you said that like conditional and unconditional cash transfer affects voting. And your sample has an age of individuals which ranges between 13 to 22. And 86% of your sample is below 18 years old. So how is that relevant to look at the effects of like voting particularly if 86% of your sample is not eligible to do that? And finally would be like on heterogeneity of your paper. So basically social, the, the conditional cash transfer programs, for example, has an effect on educational outcome in different parts of the world, particularly, for example, when you say like Mexico, Progresa. So I believe that if PSNP, which is one of the conditional cash transfer program in Ethiopia, had an effect on educational outcome, I believe individuals may have a heterogeneous effect on siblings ratio on educational outcomes. So it may, it may be an important idea to look at it if there is heterogeneity in average treatment effect based on the PSN effect exposure, which varies across different regions, as well as like maybe based on like the household location, maybe like households located in, in different parts of, near to Addis and households located far to Addis may have a different perception of education based for parents. So it may also have like heterogeneous effect. So I would like to, here some clarifications on this. Thanks. Uh, thank you, esteemed opponent, for your nice uh, work, for your works and challenging questions. Uh, the first one, um, of course, I cannot rule out, um, especially in rural, uh, in in the rural Ethiopia, boys would be preferred, right? I cannot rule out that. But what I could say is based on the. Um, based on the literature from uh, the demography field. Uh, what they say explains, um, uh, uh, okay, so if there is a boy preference, uh, preference for boys, parents would have to, uh, to shape their reproduction behavior such that they, want, they end up having more boys, right? So what happens is if they keep having girls, they end up having more uh, larger family size if they don't, uh, they don't get the desired level of uh, boys. So what the demography literature suggests is if um, a, a society is practicing sun targeting reproduction behavior, the uh, girls would be born to larger family sizes. So this is a very simple thing to test since we have data um, we simply uh, checked for the sibling size for boys and girls. And 
at least within that uh, analysis, we don't find such sun targeting behavior exists, right? So um, I know because <laughs> I'm also from, uh, from Ethiopia, I understand people have, especially in rural areas, preferences for boys, but they don't seem to be doing all the necessary steps to get uh, as, as many boys as possible, at least based on the data I'm using. So that kind of gave me um, a bit of, um, let's say confidence on the, the validity of some identification assumption. Um, the second question is about uh, time. Uh, in, in uh, um, so yeah, it's it's true there, uh, that might be a problem, but um, we do control for um, uh, period time, uh, fixed effects. So we would hope that would take out um, some of these time related uh, heterogeneities between households with slightly more boys and slightly more, more girls. And um, the question related to voting, yes. We have um, adolescents at baseline uh, between the ages of 13 and 22, um, but the baseline was collected in 2007 and in the line was collected in 2012. So by 2012, um, the youngest of our respondents would be um, 18 years of age. Um, of, and the, voting, um, uh, the vote question on voting was only included in the last round of the survey. So also the, the PIs of the original experiment, I would say kind of understood the dynamics and the, they only included the uh, question on voting in the last round. But of course, um, if the, the youngest would be 18 by 2012 and there might not have been an election she could have participated in that year, right? So what we did, was, uh, what I did was um, I checked for when elections uh, were in Malawi and the general election was without, uh, not within that frame but I couldn't find any information on the, let's say, local, local elections. So the next step was to look at whether this um, age group has responded yes to, uh, to the voting question. And I, I find that non-zero uh, respondents have said they've participated in some sort of election. So if they said they've participated, they would be counted as voters. If they said they didn't participate or it was uh, not applicable, they would be coded as missing, so they wouldn't be part of the analysis. Um, yes, and the last question is um, why I should have looked at the impact heterogeneity of uh, sibling sex composition based on uh, PSNP participation, because PSNP depends on the family size. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, yes, it's true. I should have thought about that because I know I control for the, um, I think I control for PSNP participation or maybe we took it out later, I don't know. Um, let me check, yeah. Um, no, I think we, we took it out because we have now wealth index and land ownership for economic, uh, for, the, um, uh, for the economic condition of the household. But it would be interesting to see, of course, if um, that would have an, an implication and yeah. Um, we, will, we will do that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The uh, opposition will now be continued by uh, Dr. Martorano, who is Associate Professor at UNU Merit at uh, this university. Professor Martorano. Thank you, thank you, Pro Rector. Uh, dear Rivot, uh, dear candidate, uh, first of all, let me to congratulate with you for your study. I really enjoyed reading it and I think that this dissertation provides important contributions to the body of the academic knowledge focusing on human and the social capital. So my question, my first question is mainly on chapter three. I was really surprised about the, uh, the fact that you extended the discussion on social capital, including also the voting uh, uh, outcomes. Uh, and in particular, um, uh, I was uh, uh, very interested about the results that you find that uh, both programs reduced uh, voting at national and uh, local uh, elections. So I think also you highlighted that these results could be very important in perspective, uh, in, in terms of uh, 
uh, democratizations uh, and uh, making stronger our institutions uh, and uh, and so on. So um, I um, I think, however, that uh, this uh, variable would deserve more space and maybe discussion. And basically, because uh, my feeling is that, uh, or at least in my knowledge, uh, uh, this to my knowledge, this is more related to this variable to vertical trust rather than horizontal trust. Uh, by contrast, uh, the link between social capital and voting is less evident to me. And uh, the thesis, uh, at least the chapter, so on, doesn't help to, to, to make a clear connection between uh, these uh, variables. So I wonder if you can elaborate more uh, why, in your opinion, uh, these variables uh, uh, cash transfers could lead uh, to um, changes in uh, voting uh, behavior. Thanks. Esteemed uh, opponent, thank you for your words and for your question. Um, yes. So um, I will start uh, with the like our motivation before um, we included the voting analysis. Um, our, our main aim when we started was to see whether conditional cash transfers would have a stronger effect on conditional behavior and unconditional cash transfers would have um, stronger effects on more altruistic behavior. And then when we looked into the data, we couldn't find um, uh, a variable, let's say, or information on an actual altruistic behavior. So we had to go for a proxy. And then the, the best we could do was voting since voting has some component of um, altruistic behavior, right? People vote because of many reasons, but also be out of uh, altruism. So we thought, okay, maybe this could be a good proxy. But then when we looked at the results, it seems like both conditional and unconditional cash transfers reduce voting. And when we looked into um, the literature, uh, mostly from Latin America, they show that con uh, both kind of cash transfers seem to increase either uh, voting or um, um, election results of incumbent governments, etc. So we started wondering, okay, what is the difference between the cash transfer we are uh, evaluating and the cash transfer in Latin America? And the only difference seems to be that the ones in Latin America are provided by the government, but the one we are um, evaluating is provided by an, an, an NGO. So we thought it could be, since this non-governmental organization is taking care of you, you, it could be easy for these other young women to lose interest in local, uh, local politics. So that's how we, we ended up with that kind of conclusions. We started from like trying to see a behavioral uh, change and then we ended up interpreting the results from a political participation point of view. Very, very interesting explanation. I don't know, Bro Rector, if I have time for the second question, otherwise I can wait and give space to- There's still a bit of time, so. Okay. So my second question is on chapter two. And um, basically, I was um, um, I, I was not I was a bit surprised. I like the, the fact that you use mental health as one of the mediator, but I was not totally sure about uh, subjective well-being. And in particular, mm -hmm. this could be maybe a comment or a way of thinking for extending uh, your work, maybe. And in particular, in particular, I wonder why uh, basically subjective well-being is mainly a question related to the, your current status and the emotional response to, to, to the, your situation. No? Mm -hmm. While in the, the data set that you are using, there are other variables that could play maybe a better role. So, and in particular, there is uh, questions about aspirations and explanations uh, uh, on uh, education and future job that uh, may better capture the pathway through which family decisions affect uh, human capital development. Mm -hmm. And importantly, these questions are uh, both at children and uh, at uh, parents' level. So I wonder if you tried to, to to test them or you are planning to use them in the future, maybe as also uh, Professor DeFalco suggested, trying to work more on the uh, mm -hmm. mechanism side of your mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you um, so much for these questions. They're, of course, very challenging. Um, yes, so um, 
when we started, it could, yeah, I agree, maybe the naming could be a bit um, misleading, but we were kind of trying to see the like physical well-being and mental well-being kind of aspect. Uh, so that's why we thought, okay, we could proxy it with their um, evaluation of their current uh, life situation. Um, of course, we also wanted to use, to see the effects, for example, on self-esteem. Um, but then when we looked at the data, uh, there was a lot of missing, <laughs> missing values. So we were like, okay, maybe we're better off if we just stick with um, um, the variable that has um, re reasonable response rates. And yeah, with the subjective well-being or the what we call mental well-being, it's also collected on the parents or caregivers level and we control for that as well. So it kind of also um, provides us a nice way to control for any correlations there. Um, with aspirations, um, my, like when I was looking into the data, I was kind of interested in looking at the effect on uh, aspiration, but we had, I think only one in one round, they collect, so it wasn't consistent. In some rounds, I find the variable, in some rounds, I don't, so that's um, why I, I decided not to um, go deep in, in that direction, yeah. But it would be interesting, of course. Thank you, thank you very much for your response. Thank you. The opposition will now be continued by Professor Cohen, who is professor of the, of the economics of technical change uh, at UNU Merit uh, at Maastricht University. Your candidate, dear Hugh Watt, uh, let me add my word of congratulations on uh, finishing your thesis. Um, and let me re-emphasize something that's been said before, that the thesis was very well written. I have to really congratulate you on the quality of the language in the thesis. Let me, however, jump straight to the point. Um, I want to ask you again about chapter two. I apologize for that. And again, a little bit about the mechanisms involved. Um, and in particular, the development of the argument on pages 35 and 36, at least in my copy, it was 35 and 36. And you say it would be difficult to exclude low ability children from the investments that parents make. But we do that all the time. Only one of my children gets ballet lessons. And sad to say, the other one does not benefit very much from it. Um, so we do, we do exclude children from investments. All, any parent knows that. I'm sure you know that. Um, so to make that argument stick, you have to make the claim that the investments are public goods. Mm -hmm. So for that to be credible, we need first, we need to know a lot more about the kinds of investments that you're talking about here, which is not super obvious in the, in the thesis. Then in developing that further, you say um, the spillover from parents' investments, uh, it's a spillover rather than increased income is one of the results that comes out of that because part of it is if there are more boys, maybe they work more and, and so on. So if it's not from increased income, then we're talking about a fixed income, in which case the number of children should definitely matter. Mm -hmm. a fixed amount of investment over a variable number of children. So output per child should vary. Mm -hmm. Unless it really is a public good. And the, the investment is some kind of public good from which you cannot exclude people. So we come back to what is the investment. But, then comes the second thing, even if it's a public good, the rationale for making the investment in the first place will vary with the number of children. The more kids you have, the more valuable it is to invest in a public good. So there should still be some effect on the number of siblings. That should still matter. Um, and just as a footnote, uh, later on on page 40, you say, a unit increase in the brothers to siblings ratio increases boys' time spent on productive tasks by 0 0.065 hours per day. That's four minutes. Um, it's not really surprising if you don't find an income effect. Four minutes is not going to change anybody's income. Um, so it would have been nice to, to link those two things together. Anyway, um, so I was, I was puzzled by all of this. And... Maybe you can cast some light, shed some light on it. Mm -hmm. Hi, esteemed opponent. Uh, thank you for your words and um, your question. And of course, the comments, I agree. Uh, yeah, I, it would have been nice to connect 
the meaning of the, the hours spent on productive tasks by boys. And yes, it might not have been the um, brothers contributing to household income because we don't find the like well-being and physical, um, physical and mental well-being to be the mediators. Um, with respect to the sibling size, I agree. It would matter, of course. And uh, we do control for sibling size in all of our regressions. Um, so what we, are, we were um, kind of considering is um, parents would invest more in boys. So let's say, for example, now they, they buy more supplementary books. So not from, okay, I know uh, ballet would, <laughs> would have an, uh, some contribution on their human capital in some way, but maybe from like a, a more direct perspective. So they might be buying them more supplementary books, uh, might be buying them more um, um, nutritious food or um, subscribing them to some tutorial classes, all these things, right? So we were considering that scenario where households would spend uh, in, in investment types that might be directly related to um, affecting human capitals of boys. And those investments, for example, if the boy gets a new book, um, everyone in the household, including the um, female children, would, would have access to it. So if it's a, a good nutritious food, they might have access to it. If the boy is going to extra classes, they might have the materials from the courses or he might be tutoring them. And that way they could, they could benefit um, from such investments. That was where our brain was when we thought of it. That, that all sounds quite speculative to me, but anyway. Uh, Pro-Rector, do I have time for one more question? Um, a little bit of time, yes. Okay, um, this is kind of a nasty question. Um, you say the average brother to sibling ratio is 0.44. And then you say, but notice that we have more boys in our sample than girls, which would lead to a lower than half brothers to sibling ratio. I, I think that's incorrect. Um, imagine you had a population of all boys. This brother to sibling ratio would be one. If you have a population of all girls, the brother to sibling ratio would be zero. One is bigger than a half and zero is less than a half. In fact, the, within a, fa a single family, the average brother to sibling ratio is the number of boys over the number of children. Yes. So that says that within a family, the brother to sibling ratio is positively correlated to the number of boys. So I'm a little puzzled by that and wondering um, if there's something funny going on. Mm -hmm. Yes, so we were also wondering why, okay, so in a, let's say a normal population, we, would, we were expecting to find the brothers to sibling ratio to be around 0.5. But in our case, we found much less. And then when I looked at the sample distribution of boys and girls, we had more boys. So I thought since in, um, in the total uh, sibling size, the young life's child were, was not part of the ratio calculation. We thought, okay, since I have more boys here, it could be why I end up with a smaller brothers to siblings ratio. It won't make up to the whole difference but it might be explaining part of it. Sorry, I didn't understand. Um, okay, so the ratio of brothers to siblings um, is calculated such that um, you have the number of brothers divided by the total uh, sibling size. And the, in our sample, we have more boys than girls. So I thought the siblings ratio, so um, the, youngest, the young life's child, if it's a boy, we are not considering him to be a brother to himself. Right. So we are considering brothers outside of the young life's child divided by the total uh, siblings. So if most of the young life's children are boys, not most, like we have more boys, so that yeah, might yeah, reduce but... the brother's share. Yeah, but the boys who are sampled are, are siblings of the people who weren't sampled. Oh, yes, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But here I, I was considering them to be siblings to themselves, so they were kind of out of the, that consideration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank yeah. you.
Thank you. The opposition will now be continued by Dr. Matthew, who is a postdoctoral researcher, a re researcher at UNU Merit at Maastricht University. Um, hi, dear candidate, uh, dear Hivot, many congratulations on your thesis. So I'll get directly to the question, uh, which is again on chapter two, sorry for that. Um, uh, so, um, which is your first essay. So you find uh, that children born to families with more male siblings may benefit from higher investments. So I, I highly appreciate the, the, the fact that you try a lot to dig deep into the mechanisms underlying uh, these relationships. So you look at elder siblings education, you look at gender norms, uh, but you're not able to really pinpoint the mechanism. So as Bruno was pointing out, it's possible that you're missing out some of the aspects. Um, so, uh, I mean, here you, you proxy gender norms uh, by using the time spent on household cores and household productive tasks. So uh, do you think that uh, other aspects of gender uh, norms or attitudes that you would have liked to check, so which you believe might play a mediating role uh, um, but you, you were not able to do that due to data constraints. So you, do you want to discuss uh, some of these, especially, uh, let's say, in the context uh, of, uh, of Ethiopia? So mm -hmm. are there any cultural factors, customs, traditions that might change the expectations on uh, future jobs? So uh, let me give you an example. For example, in, in India, the, the high dowry system, the high amount of uh, money the parents uh, or the women pay to the groom, um, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's so much of a large amount. And since the income of the woman after marriage goes to the new family, uh, parents uh, tend to uh, invest very few. So, and the expectations are very few. So are there any kind of institutional factors that change these kind of uh, expectations or that hamper or that uh, creates a problem in reducing the, the gap. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. My esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Uh, okay, so obviously there could be many other, um, uh, especially perception and attitude related factors um, that might be affecting with the way parents make investments even the way um, the children themselves um, set their expectations uh, to themselves and um, let's say their expected or aspirations as um, um, the opponent before also mentioned, right? So it would be nice if I could have data, for example, on the perception of parents towards their children disaggregated by gender, um, the, the aspiration also to um, their female and male children, um, it could be, for example, like from um, anecdotal evidence in my own experience, um, it could be that parents don't expect much uh, from the female children except to, to grow up to be um, a good wife, right? Um, but when it comes to their uh, boys, they might have <clears throat> let's say bigger expectations. They might want to see him as the president of um, the country or uh, a CEO of a certain company. So it, the same also goes to the children themselves. How do female children... Uh, perceive their own um, uh, skills and their own future, uh, their own aspirations, what do they expect of themselves. If there would be detailed data on such, um, such uh, uh, aspects, it, it would have been uh, more interesting also to see how even the sex composition of your siblings would have, um, would have affected um, the, these kind, the kinds of beliefs you have about yourselves and about your, um, your future. And that would have been, um, that would have provided a much more interesting and detailed insights. Um, thank you. Uh, do I have time for another quick uh, follow-up or? Certainly, there's no yeah, bit sure. of time for one more question. Yeah, uh, so based on your answer, so if you tell that it's about the difference in expectations, can you give an example of a policy that could help in reducing uh, this, this gap? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. good question. <laughs> so, um, policy, it's, it will always uh, have to be uh, purely speculative and, you know, because everything needs to be tested if it will work. So for example, uh, a way to, to break um, such perception biases would be obviously to have people who would serve as, uh, serve as role models. Right? If you could see uh, females 
let's say, uh, leading a country or um, a company, or it could be in a different way, but if you could see females uh, in the front uh, uh, where you could aspire to become, that would help. But how do you get there? How do you bring role models? You have to start somewhere. And if you, you don't, you, you're starting in a society where you, you don't have um, well-trained females to bring to such positions, you have to start somewhere. And these places could be, for example, um, trying to do- Oh, asked. Yeah, candidate, could you uh, please briefly uh, complete your answer to the question? Okay, thank you. So um, one way to start could be trying to design an information campaign, um, an educational campaign, where you could, you could train uh, house uh, families, um, the words of, their children and the, the importance of investing in their ch children or in the importance of changing your perceptions. If, if we are talking about uh, changing perceptions of the adolescents themselves, it could help to, to provide educational programs and set their uh, expectations in the desired way. Thank you. He would make Conan Mesfin. The time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations uh, and our return in this room. Thank you.
Welcome back, everybody. Hiwot Mekonen Mesvin. The degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee uh, has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Nielsen is authorized to confer upon you uh, this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor now to take the floor. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, of course. But the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Hiwat Mekonen Mesfin, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you, virtually then, with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university. So congratulations, Hilab. I will say a few words before I hand over to Francesco, who will do the laudatio. Dear Dr. Mesfin, dear Hiwas, I'm very happy to be the first one to congratulate you with having achieved this milestone. So this journey started off as a bit of a rocky road, I'd say. It took us all quite a while to figure out what you wanted, what we as supervisors wanted, and how to reconcile this, and that wasn't so easy. But then Francesco emerged, and with him, he brought a bout of energy that spilled over to the rest of the team. And within a few months, we hit the ground running. Your first completed paper got accepted in almost one go. I mean, we did have a revise and resubmit, but that was fairly doable in EDCC. And most of all, if not all of us here today know that this is no small achievement, getting this past the desk of EDC's editor and his team of reviewers. The second paper you finished, and that was still, um, I think, part of most of the discussion that we had today, so the chapter on the brothers and siblings that you finish now is being prepared for a second round of revisions at Economics and Human Biology, also a good channel. And your third paper on cash transfers and collective action um, is now a single author paper. It still may need some work, but I'm also very confident that this will also find, it, find its way into a good channel. So the way I see this journey, here it is as if we were on a, on a mountain hike, right? So there's rocky terrain at first with many paths to sort of choose from. But once the gradient increased, the goal, but also the path becomes clearer, the steps become much bigger, but also firmer. And that's really what you have showed. And then you made it, right? Um, so Kira, I really look back at a very fruitful collaboration with you. I wish you all the best for your future, which in my view looks really bright. And I will now hand over to Francesco for the Laudatio. Thank you, Professor Nielsen. <clears throat> dear Dr. Mesfin, dear Hewitt, um, we got in touch the first time exactly three years ago, apparently, when a former colleague contacted me informally regarding the possibility of co-supervising an Ethiopian student doing a PhD at UNU Merit. This was even before Professor Nielsen contacted me formally. He said, and I quote, she's a very motivated and hardworking, as well as friendly to work with. And she's interested to do her studies in behavioral and experimental economics in developing countries. It seemed like a good fit. In fact, you were a rather atypical PhD student to start working with. First, you had already started your PhD quite some time back. Second, you had already done a lot of field work in Ethiopia for a project under Oxford University, but that had, done, that had been more in the role of a research assistant and none of the data you had collected could be used for your own thesis. And third, you had recently won a grant worth 35,000 euros from CODESRIA, the Council for Development and Social Science Research in Africa, and you were very eager to start collecting your own data as soon as possible. In your email exchanges, I could sense urgency and motivation, 
like my colleague had described. You then sent me a draft proposal for an experiment on extension, and we slowly started mulling about a collaboration. But it wasn't until September that year that we met in person for the first time. This again was a, was a rather atypical encounter. Maastricht, where you lived and studied, and Wageningen, where I work, are not exactly well connected in terms of public transport. Eventually, we decided to meet in a cafe in the underground passage of Amsterdam Central Station. I distinctly remember thinking that an external observer might have been more inclined to believe this meeting was part of some spy story than to guess it was an introductory meeting between a PhD student and supervisor. We talked for hours about your and my ideas on experiments, development, and Ethiopia, a bit of everything. There we set the basis for your experimental paper on extension, trust, and overconfidence. It was a very intellectually stimulating encounter. And even if we agreed to just give one paper a try and see if it was a good fit for me to be your supervisor, I left the spy story setting with a feeling that it would be an interesting journey to supervise you and that you had the potential to go till the end. Little did we know that a meeting would be the first and last time we would see each other in person, at least until now. Several factors played a role in that. First, as I said, you were supercharged to go to the field as soon as possible. So after we met, we had an intense exchange of emails uh, and online meetings with Loneke, Niash, and myself, which meant that by January, you were already in Ethiopia running your experiment. And by March, you were back in, Ma in Maastricht with all the data collected, a record. And the record didn't stop there. As, as uh, Professor Nielsen already mentioned, by April, you had written the results section. By June, the first draft of the paper was ready. And this chapter is now published in EDCC, one of the most prestigious international journals in the field of experimental um, economics applied to developing countries. And the speed at which you got this achievement proved to be quite fortunate too. In fact, the second reason we didn't meet again is needless to say, connected to the outbreak of the COVID pandemic. We can now say with confidence that had you not been pushing vigorously to collect your data as soon as possible, it may have never happened at all. It is not always easy to be a PhD student in these uncertain times. For you, these were exacerbated by the conflict that ravaged Ethiopia in the last years including areas where your family comes from. But you had the strength to regroup and start working on secondary data for your other chapters. Quite impressive. You had the intuition of studying the role of siblings in the human capital accumulation of adolescents in Ethiopia, a topic that was possibly influenced by the role your own brother played in your life. In any case, it once again showed your steadfast ambition to get the work done. And a similar motivation guided your third papers on, on the effects of conditional and unconditional cash transfers on trust. All three chapters of your thesis are highly original and they show empirically that common sense is sometimes not common nor sense. Smallholder farmers are not timid about their knowledge but rather overconfident. More male siblings make female children more educated, not less. And trust increases when cash transfers are conditional, not a mere altruistic giveaway. Looking back at the journey together, I remember times in which the road to completion seemed infinite to you, when you were perhaps contemplating if it was worth getting until the end and if it was worth all the effort. I hope today you will finally have an answer to these doubts. You have first and foremost yourself to thank for today's achievement. You should be proud of your PhD thesis. It is of high quality, analytically rich and well-written. It shows that you are a very capable economist able to defend her ideas and investigate interesting research topics, be it collecting experimental primary data or finding secondary data suitable to a research question. I think I speak on behalf of the entire supervision team when I say that it was a great, great pleasure to work with you and see you push through the hard times to get where you are now. In hindsight, it was undoubtedly right to think that it would be an interesting journey and believing at all times that despite all the adversities, and the limited time available, you would make it. You made it. So let me close by congratulating you and your family with this great achievement. The online defense misses the grandeur and excitement of being together in an aula, but it doesn't diminish the importance of this day for you, for your future career path, and for your beloved ones. Congratulations, Hewitt. Dear Dr. Meswin, dear Hewitt, also on behalf of the Board of Deans, I congratulate you with the honor you have acquired just now. Congratulations. Thank you. I uh, 
formally close this session, but I think uh, there is still uh, time uh, for uh, congratulations. Uh, so I think we can stay here for a few minutes. So congratulations.